So welcome to my Get A Life moment for today with myself, Lisa Davies, and I'm delighted to be joined by the chairman of the Gusto Group, Steph Wright. Welcome, Steph. Good morning, Lisa. Now, we first met, we've, we've seen each other a lot in local networking groups, but, you know, thinking back, I was thinking about this this morning, I'm pretty sure that we first met at BBC Radio Lincolnshire, maybe doing some interviews or doing lunch brunch or something like that when you were involved with the Lincoln City Football Club. I might be wrong, but I seem to yeah, recall I, that. I, you know what? I seem to, I do remember doing a, a lunch uh, brunch or uh, event or uh, interview at uh, BBC Radio Lincolnshire, yeah. So it might years. be there, it might be there. I was trying to think back. Obviously, we've seen each other a lot in local business networks, but, I, you know, I'm sure that was it. So for those people watching in and listening in today, who is Steph Wright? <laughs> who is Steph Wright? Big question. Uh, well... Uh, a, a local lad uh, grew up in a little village called East Markham. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was the vicar of East Markham, yeah. and uh, uh, they, they'd moved. My parents had moved uh, down from London, so the, the, my father had uh, brought, been brought up and lived in the East End of London. Uh, and interestingly, when he was training to be a vicar, he came out to Callum Hall, which uh, oh, right. uh, people probably remember uh, used to be a monastery. Uh, so he came out there, he did his training out there. Uh, my father was born in 1912, so he was wow. 50 when I was born. So there was a big generation gap there. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, then he moved back out to East Markham and I was born in, in the village. So I grew up in a, a small village, um, which I, th I think has had a big impact upon me in terms of the way I think about things, you know, I, uh, things were done in a very old-fashioned way in a little village and because my father was so much older and there was a big age gap there yeah. you know the, the, we lived a very sort of old-fashioned life I remember uh, you know my mother going out and uh, cutting nettles down and making nettle soup and uh, wow. <laughs> like that uh, so yeah so that was that was my upbringing really uh, and then moved to Collingham uh, when I was 15 and went to uh, the Magnus School in New York uh, and then lived really in and around Collingham. Uh, I used to enjoy travelling, so I've travelled around a little bit and spent time in uh, Australia and various other places, uh, but always come back and uh, and grown my businesses locally. So, so like a homing pigeon, you might say. A little bit like a homing pigeon, keep coming back. A homing pigeon. Keep, keep yeah, coming yeah. back to the little villages locally. <laughs> so it's really interesting because I, I, I actually I asked a sneaky peek at your LinkedIn before we did the interview. And I know that you're such an incredible entrepreneur. And you know, we're going to go on to talk about some of the things that you you are doing and gonna be doing. But it all seemed to start with being uh, a DJ at 17, is that right? <laughs> Yeah, so I, uh, I I left school and uh, I left school at 16. Uh, I went to New York College for a year and did uh, a REMI course, so the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers course, although I wasn't a, uh, working for REMI, I was just doing it on my own. Uh, and, and then I just, I fancied being a DJ, so I'd uh, got some old equipment and I used to go uh, to pubs and and do it and do it at the local youth club in Collingham. Uh, and then I went to work for RHP. That was the first, the only sort really? of proper job yeah. I've ever had. I worked in the grindery at RHP for six months. And whilst I was there, I saved up enough money to buy uh, some proper equipment and to start a mobile disco. Uh, and I quite often get asked, where does the name Gusto come from? Because my yeah. group is called the Gusto Group. Uh, and my construction and homes company are called gusto homes and gusto construction uh, and it came back to my first business which was my dj business uh, i needed a name for it uh, and chatting to my mother and she's my mother's an artist a very creative sort of thinker uh, and she wrote down a list of different potential names and one of them was dr gusto uh, and so after sort of going through the list we decided that yeah dr gusto's got a nice ring to it so that was the name 
uh, and it stuck really for all and the so the gusto so, group was born right back then so you mentioned there a couple of things that you do in your sort of collection of group of businesses so for those people who don't know you maybe are listening from overseas or around the world what what sort of um, businesses business sectors does the gusto group step into yeah, it's quite diverse, but there is, there's a sort of story and a narrative that links everything together. Uh, so uh, having uh, started a mobile disco up and so obviously got an interest in entertainment and uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, I thought I needed a proper job and the proper job was uh, building. So I went and did a building diploma at Baysford Hall College, uh, bought myself a van and a wheelbarrow and started doing job in building work. Uh, and so uh, built that business up really from, obviously from grassroots uh, up to a decent sized company. Now we build about 50 or 60 houses a year mm -hmm. uh, and we're doing larger and larger sites now. Uh, so we're a house builder. Uh, we've been innovating in the house building sector for over 20 years now, uh, building low energy houses and looking mm. at sort of new technologies that we can put into housing. Uh, we've got an architect's practice. Uh, so as a house builder, it's uh, uh, obviously you're interested in design. So we've we developed our own in-house uh, capability uh, with uh, our SGA uh, architect's practice. Uh, one of the technologies I got into uh, as a house builder uh, was rainwater harvesting. So basically putting these large underground tanks in to collect the rainwater from the roofs of houses. Uh, and that business grew quite quickly in the early, uh, well, it must have been about 2001 to 2005. Yeah. Uh, so we were bringing in lots and lots of tanks from Germany. Uh, and so I decided to start getting the manufactured locally. And we used a company called Rotatech, a rotation mm. molding company. Uh, and unfortunately, they had some financial problems in about 2010. Uh, so we ended up uh, buying the company out of administration. Uh, at the time, it was uh, losing about half a million pounds a year. It was turning over about uh, two and a half million, yeah. uh, employing about 40 staff. Uh, but had some really good technical expertise within the company and uh, good machines. And it was a shame to have seen it gone, go under. Uh, so we bought that. Uh, and over the period of time, last 10 years, we've turned that business around. We've uh, now got three factories. I've just bought another wow. factory. Uh, we employ about 140 people uh, and turnover is uh, 11 million pound a year, I think. And it's profitable. Uh, so yeah, so we so we're manufacturers, house builders, uh, designers. We've then got into uh, a global opportunity, which is similar to Zoom. So we've got a, a company called Colab, yeah. uh, and we're creating a virtual world. So it's a digital platform. Uh, so again. Uh, there's, there is a sort of link between all these things uh, and I, I always think with my sort of ambitions to create a virtual world uh, I'm doing that with the same mindset as a developer yes. uh, so as a developer you start off with a blank sheet of paper uh, and you decide you know what, what type of uh, houses buildings what type of community you're going to create because it's not just about putting buildings up it's about thinking about the community mm. that's going to inhabit the buildings and the best way to design it for people to be able to enjoy living in that space uh, and so it's the same approach to creating a virtual world you know how can we create a virtual world that people are going to enjoy interacting with each other through it's really interesting because i hear that word come up so often from you, community. It's really important to you, isn't it, Steph? Community. And the fact that you came back to, no matter where you've been in the world, you kind of come back to your community, don't you? Um, and this, it, it seems to be a theme whenever I've spoken to you, even if it's a global community, because I'm sure you'll mention global grad as well. Um, this, this, this feeling of community seems to be fundamental for you. Yeah, it, and I, it's interesting it probably does go all the way back to being brought up in a little village mm. uh, and you know the 
importance of that community. And, you know, my dad was the vicar. He was a very un, <laughs> uh, unconventional vicar. Uh, I think, you know, when he, after he retired and before he died, he, he pretty much gave up on the religious bit of being a vicar. <laughs> I think he gave up actually uh, in believing, uh, which is a, a part of being a vicar. Uh, but the other probably more important part of being a vicar is uh, bringing the community together yeah uh, and the uh, and, and that's what he, he and my mother were fantastic at you know within East Markham they used to put on plays in the village they used to uh, print the local newspaper which was called the East Markham Gazette uh, which I used to have to uh, run around the village and post through people's letterboxes and you know it was just it's just a community there was nothing mm. particularly special about it it's that's how people lived uh, and, and I do think that that sense of community is going to be the key uh, to us moving forward as a, as a species we, we it's so important that we uh, are able to sort of go back to the way we used to live and pull together the best bits of how we used to live um, rather than uh, continue down Jeff Bezos's uh, Amazon route of us all being consumers to a global uh, corporations because yeah. that isn't the way forward. What, what's really beautiful is when I listen to how, you know, how your businesses work and your ethos behind them, obviously the eco side of your building, you know, the, the techno technological advances that you've been very innovative in for way before most of your competitors way ahead. So you've got that real mix of how simple communities connected together in the past in meaningful mm -hmm. ways, whilst also embracing frontline technology to live sustainably, sustainably right into the future so that, that's got to be a, a real sort of marriage made in heaven really hasn't it excuse the pun yeah. <laughs> well I live I actually live in Lincoln now so I live on the edge of the uh, showground in Lincoln we've built 30 properties there uh, and that's very much about a sustainable community so we have shared facilities there uh, everybody is a shareholder in the wider community everybody has an allotment uh and, and and people support each other and that's mm. a big part of being a community um and, and and yeah i think i think empowering local communities has to be the way forward um local business people starting up being a you know a, the, the the what do they used to say the 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 uh, candlestick maker the butcher the baker the can candlestick maker you know yeah. all, all the little people repairing things and mending things and uh, you know making things locally uh, yeah. is, is really feels very old-fashioned sometimes when you talk about it but actually I think there's going to be a renaissance in mm. terms of people wanting to see that type of economy developing again uh, and it makes sense I think that's maybe maybe been highlighted through this uh, whole staying at home pandemic sort of situation. Maybe that really made people very much reevaluate how how we've been living our lives. Um, I hope we remember that as we start to emerge fully back out into the world now. I hope really hope we remember that. So I mentioned there before global grad. So we've got this real sort of contrast between local community and global community so what is it that you've been doing with global grad well uh, i've got i've got four children uh three went away to university and uh, one of my daughters georgia uh she left school at 18 got some good a levels uh decided not to go to university uh went off traveling and we'd all as a family done a lot of traveling anyway so uh it was something that it wasn't new to us uh, but at 18, she was sofa surfing in Israel and uh, working in uh, New Zealand and Australia and uh, traveling through South America. And so uh, she was very, uh, very much of a free spirit. Um, and, and interestingly, she, she rang me a few months into a trip. She was in Asia uh, and she was working on an elephant sanctuary or volunteering on an elephant sanctuary in uh, in. Um, Thailand or Colombia, 
Cambodia, I think. Uh, and uh, she was talking about the sustainability of the project that she's working on. And I was thinking, this is not, this doesn't sound like my daughter, Georgia. <laughs> uh, you know, she's having this really sort of uh, intelligent conversation with me about uh, sort of global and economic sustainability. Uh, and uh, I've not had that conversation with any of my other kids and they've all been off to university. <laughs> yeah. It was, it, was, it was a moment of realisation really that travel is an education yes. uh, in itself, uh, but you don't get a qualification uh, for travelling. Uh, so after she had been travelling for three years, uh, I was sort of becoming more aware of the emergence of online learning, which again has been massively scaled up through COVID. Uh, but you know, three, three or four years ago, when we started Global uh online learning was still fairly much in its infancy. Mm -hmm. You've got organisations like the Open University doing it, but uh, a lot of the mainstream universities weren't doing online learning. Uh, and so the concept was to try to combine travel with uh, online education, take students that were learning online uh, to different parts of the world, uh, link them up with uh, sustainable projects uh, so that they can uh, get, a, get the head around what's happening in different parts of the world, yeah. get them to network uh, with business people through co-working spaces, uh and yeah and it, it was starting to grow quite nicely uh i'd got a group out in vietnam when lockdown came uh, march 2020 uh absolute nightmare trying to get them all back home before all the airports shut uh and we finally managed to i think we got them out of hong kong airport literally hours before hong kong airport closed down uh, got them back to the UK and then that little team that I've got working on that project uh, we were all aware that really travel was not going to be something that was going to be happening for the foreseeable future mm. uh, and that's where we refocused our attention on the collab concept yeah. which is a fantastic uh, platform if anybody's not experienced it I mean we do the local business club hosted on collab and it is for anybody who's not experienced it, I would say, you know, pop along and have a look because it's like being in a real room, even though you're not in a real room. It's really, <laughs> it's as near as you can get to feeling like you're actually walking into a conference room or into a meeting room without being in a meeting room. And people actually work in there virtually, don't they, on different floors in different offices and can go and have a coffee together. And it's all virtual. It's, yeah, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And we put on some amazing events for global companies now. We're putting on conferences. Uh, and we did, we, uh, three or four of our team uh, were part of about 30 people that delivered the um, inauguration ball for Biden. Wow. Uh, so, uh, I, I was sat up all night with my black tie on, uh, talking to all the senators, and uh, and they've got guests like Bill Eilish, the guests. Uh, so it, it was basically an online version, a digital version of the inauguration ball that people would have paid thousands of pounds for their tickets to attend. Uh, and, and we delivered it. <laughs> Which is, I mean, platform. that is incredible. So, you know, a local business for those people who are in, in our locality, sort of Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire area, delivering that. It's just incredible. I mean, there are some real gifts that have come out of um, this whole experience, aren't they? I mean, you can't imagine that that would have happened before. Absolutely no. No way. And, and it does, and it does uh, open your eyes to the opportunity. So much as I'm a, a massive enthusiast for local trade and uh, you know local business, uh, I, I also am a massive uh, advocate for global connectivity. Mm. I think the more we can feel connected as as a, as a species on the planet, uh, the more we can start to uh, work together to try to solve the biggest problem that we're facing, which is obviously global warming mm. and uh, we've, we've got to somehow transition from the economy that we've got at the moment to one that uh, is works without putting any more carbon into the atmosphere it's almost as simple as that and how uh, do you see that how do you see that happening i know you've been sort of championing that locally in our in our business network but 
what what's your view in that how how are we going to do that it's it's a big big uh, <laughs> massive question i know <laughs> I mean, in, in very in very simple terms, uh, we I think we need to have the same urgency uh, that we've applied to COVID. Mm. You know, the world has changed in the last 18 months because of the threat of COVID. Uh, the threat of climate change uh, and global warming is a bigger, is going to do more damage globally than COVID will do in terms mm. of uh, deaths. Uh, and and damage to the planet or damage to the planet in its ability to be able to sustain our existence. Yeah. Uh, my father always said to me, I remember him telling me many, many years ago uh, that uh, don't, don't worry about the planet because the planet will look after itself. And it, it, that is very true that, you know, the, we can do a lot of damage to the planet and in a hundred thousand years time, the planet will sort itself out. Uh, so when being environmentalists for the benefit of the planet actually what we're being is environmentalists for the benefit of enabling the planet to sustain our comfortable life on the planet yeah yeah but it's like oh. the attenborough um like sort of documentary film where it, it showed um oh uh, chernobyl where literally it's rewilded itself now nobody can live in it it's actually yeah. rewilded and, and it's like a jungle that's grown around the old buildings. So, as you say, the Earth, Mother Earth, is quite capable of regenerating herself. It's whether we'll be around to see it. It's that's what right. we're doing for ourselves. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, very interesting, very interesting. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that we probably first met as a result of you being involved in, in uh, Lincoln City football. So I, I suppose we, I know that's a little while ago now, but you know, you look for these opportunities, don't you, Steph, where you get involved in things that are meaningful to you. So how was that being involved with the football? <laughs> well, I, I got involved in Collingham, the football club, which is our local village team. Uh, and had a bit of fun with that and uh, never as a manager or a player uh, although I do play walking football uh, every every fortnight uh, so I'd, I'd put a little bit of money into Collingham Football Club and enjoyed the the fun really of being involved in football uh, and we got promoted two or three times in Collingham and we played in the local in the FA Vars uh, trophy or sorry the uh, the Floodlit Cup trophy um, anyway, uh, th then I th just had this idea that I'd like to get involved in professional football. Mm. Uh, and I knew somebody uh, who was uh, very passionate about Lincoln and he was a sort of, uh, they'd started up the Lincoln Supporters Trust. So there was this movement for the supporters to uh, own and run the football club. And I always saw that as, Partly a good idea, but mm. partly not a good idea. Uh, in, in some ways, it's a bit like having, I get criticised for saying this, uh, but, you know, having fans run a club is like having uh, the uh, drinkers in a pub running the pub. <laughs> it doesn't quite work. Uh, yeah. because, uh, they can't quite see things in a sort of... To stand back from it in, in a business like way and say, actually, is this the right thing to do for the pub or is this the right thing to do for the club? Mm. So I ended up uh, doing a deal with the previous ch chairman at uh, Lincoln uh, and myself and the Lincolnshire Co op and uh, another businessman uh, basically put the money up and we, we bought the club. Uh, we, through buying the club, we enabled the fans to have the majority shareholding in the club through the supporters trust. Uh, we uh, put the uh, head of the supporters trust in, in as chairman uh, so he was chairman for the first few years uh, and then uh, I took over as chairman uh, up until 2010 so uh, we were there for 10 years mm. uh, I was involved in the club for 10 years we got into the playoffs uh, five times we wow. never got promoted uh, we uh, we took the club through administration it, uh, and we paid down about a million pounds worth of debt. Uh, so we, we put the club on a really strong sort of financial footing, uh, but also we put a structure in there. And, and mm -hmm. I'd have to 
uh, take my hat off to uh, the guy I brought in as my chief exec there, a guy called Dave Roberts, uh, for really working so well to be able to really create a proper business around the football club. You know, he put the structure there. We became an investors in people football club. Wow. We were one of the first football clubs in the UK to do that. So a lot of stuff that from a footballing perspective, people will probably look back and say, well, we never got promoted during that period, but we got to the playoffs five times. Yeah. You know, we, we, we paid off a lot of debt. We put a good foundation there. Uh, and then in 2010, I felt I'd, I'd been there long enough. I'd, it does take over your life. Uh, and I've got a lot of other things going on in business and wanted to focus on those. So I stood down and Dave Roberts, who was my chief exec, he's, he's decided he'd had enough as well and uh, wanted another challenge and, want, and enjoyed working with me. Uh, so uh, we bought the Rotor Tech business. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dave has grown the Rotor Tech business uh, and has now just actually uh, stood down from being chief exec at Rotor Tech. Uh, and so Dave's uh, retired from that and is now a helping me develop the group. So as a non-exec director of the group. So yeah, so great experience really football in terms yeah. of if you, want, if you want to have a lesson in business, then football is a great place to learn because uh, most businesses get benchmarked and assessed uh, at best probably once every six months or probably once a year when uh, you probably have to sit down in front of your shareholders and explain to them what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, football, every week. Every week. <laughs> you've got all your customers in, you've got all your shareholders in, all sitting there. And you get the real-time feedback all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and you can put all the effort you like into i used to we used to put on uh promotions to try to fill the seats up and uh, you know do kids for a quid uh, and you'd get an extra two or three thousand fans in there and then you sit there at three o'clock on a saturday afternoon hoping that the product you know yeah. about it in a business way the product you're going to deliver which is the game on the pitch uh, is going to deliver what the fans have paid for uh, and when it doesn't, when you get beaten 3-0, uh, you get that feedback. To, to you say, Steph, you crap. <laughs> <laughs> Sack your manager, sort yourself out. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. But it's all it's all part of the journey and all part of the learning. And I mean, what an eclectic mix of experiences you've had with that that, like I say, that thread running through it. So what's next? What's well, next? I'll, 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 I'll stay on the football theme very quickly. Uh, so I've, I've, I ca I've carried on the sort of interest locally in football. Uh, and so I've always sponsored Newark Town Football Club. Mm. Uh, and I got involved in the Newark Sports Association uh, and we helped to uh, design the new sports village, which has been built uh, by the, uh, with the council and YMCA. Yes. Uh, so it's a fantastic facility that just sits behind the um, Newark leisure centre uh, we've got two full-size uh, 4g pitches a full-size synthetic running track uh, and there's a multi-million pound building going up on the site as well uh, which will have the i think uh, the uk's largest uh, climbing wall inside it so it's a great facility for newark uh, newark town are the uh, the main football club that are using those facilities so that's our home ground uh, and I've just taken over as, uh, as chairman of the first team at Newark. So I'm not, uh, I'm, Newark's got a fantastic setup in terms of all the kids' teams, and uh, there's a really strong women's club growing in there as well. So the bit I'm going to be focused on is just the first team. Uh, I've just uh, employed a, a, a manager, new manager for Newark, uh, Luke, who had done a fantastic job, uh, decided to stand down. Uh, and so we've got an ex Lincoln City player. Right. Guy called Nathan Arnold uh, as manager, uh, and so we, we're basically going to uh, see if we can take Newark Town Football Club on an exciting journey, which will hopefully be fantastic for Newark. Fantastic. Uh, get some um, you know businesses involved uh, with it as well, and see see what we can do with that. Um, so that's that's what we're doing in football. 
um, in uh, other stuff. Uh, I was saying about my rotor tech business, we've just bought a new factory. So we're trying to transition our manufacturing away from using gas to being all electric. Yeah. Uh, so we, we're looking at um, putting a lot of robots, electric robots into the factory, uh, basically becoming a, a zero carbon uh, manufacturer. Uh, so that's our aim there. And it's going to be that would be incredible, wouldn't it? Absolutely incredible. Yeah, and looking at the types of products we make, we're, we're already uh, Europe's biggest manufacturer of sailing boats, uh, of sailing dinghies, uh, of electric boats. Uh, so we're looking at microelectric vehicles as, as a product uh, that, we, that we're wanting to develop. Uh, and then we're continuing on with our, our housing business and, and growing that. But alongside building eco or low energy traditional houses we're also looking at, at micro housing uh, right. so tiny little houses uh, that you can build in areas of woodland so i've sort of got this vision of being able to create new communities in uh, different types of settings mm -hmm. sort of woodland settings uh, for young people to live in uh, without cars so with micro vehicles uh, so you don't have to put all the infrastructure in for cars and, and everything else that uses a lot of materials they've got a lot of carbon uh, uh, heavy carbon footprint in basically putting a development together whereas if you can you sort of almost have a little bit like glamping but glam glamping that's permanent yes yes uh, where people can live uh, because one of the big challenges really for people is I mean, accommodation and housing people is a massive challenge yes uh, but an even bigger challenge for young people that can't get on the housing ladder uh, so I think that whole concept of housing needs to be rethought through uh, and done in a different way uh, and, and you know, people will be prepared to live in a different way if it's healthy and enjoyable and, yeah and that, absolutely and, and and i know i'm going on a bit here but the most the most important thing in business is that people want to buy your products you've got to build some you want to make thing and do want uh, and if people are going to move away from the lifestyles that we've got at the moment which are damaging the the planet and need, so we need to move away from uh the way we do things at the moment uh, yeah. to a different way of doing things but people will only make that change if the other way of doing it uh, becomes attractive and appealing to yeah. people and yeah the, uh, people feel good about it and people feel healthy because they're doing something that's that's different um it, it can't be uh an option that people don't want to do well, otherwise otherwise it won't it won't won't fly you won't you as my my uh, dad would have said it doesn't turn coal so <laughs> that's it you're not gonna you're not gonna sell the product if people people can't connect with it and it, it, it's it's rare i mean i speak to lots of great people on get a life moment but it's it's such a pleasure and such a rarity to find somebody who is such a visionary. I mean, a true entrepreneur in the real, you know, in the real meaning of it, but such a visionary that has that absolute balance of we're in business to make money. Of course we are. But it's almost like do no harm, do no harm to the people or the planet. This is real sort of uh, basis, like a come back to community, you know, sustainability that runs throughout everything that you do. So yes, of course it, it makes a profit. Of course it's a, they're great businesses, but actually for the benefit of all, everybody yeah, gets. And, and then it's and then it's what you do with your profit as well, because there's only a certain amount of money that you know I can spend, uh, and and I, I don't have an extravagant lifestyle. Uh, so what's the best thing to do with that profit? Well, one thing we've started doing is putting the profit back into the community, mm -hmm. uh, and. <laughs> and, and people might think it's a bit daft but it to me it makes total sense so we've just started a project last year where we gave all our staff 500 pounds to put back into their local community so yeah. find a project a, a, a product uh, sorry a project uh, local to them something that they've got an interest in 
in their physical community where they live and uh, make that that they can then make the decision on where they want their 500 pounds to go so we did that last year we're doing it again this year we've now expanded that to all the people that buy our houses now get 500 pounds to put back into the community where their new house is so by doing that what you're doing is you're strengthening the communities and making the communities better and if the communities are better uh, where people are buying our houses then people are going to be more inclined to buy houses in those communities it's it's a win-win all around isn't it it just makes sense it just makes sense it makes absolute sense so um obviously i've taken up lots of your time i know you're a bit and you're on holiday so you know just just to say you've come and done the get a life moment and you're on holiday in norfolk so if there's been some ins and outs of the signals because you're enjoying yourself in norfolk and it looks a beautiful day there as well um but just before we finish as i ask all of my guests um if you were to give the listeners and viewers a top tip for life steph what would it be top tip for life uh understand understand the big global issue which is climate change Mm -hmm. Uh, well global warming let's use the correct language global warming if we don't do something about it uh, then we're uh, not only going to screw the world up for ourselves uh, for those of us that are young enough to have a few years ahead of us because we're that that up job has already started we can mm. see it i think uh so understand spend a little bit of time to really understand it because i think it is important uh, to understand it and then think local do things yeah. local empower like your local community uh don't live in your own little bubble uh connect up to your, your local community and and i think if we could start to get our local communities really becoming vibrant again uh, then our quality of life will be better. Our health and mental health and well-being will be better. Uh, you know, we we can not be uh, addicted to the uh, the drug of amism, the drug of uh, fossil fuel. Uh, we've got to somehow find a way to move away from that and 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 do it in an enjoyable, healthy way. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a bit of a boring thing to say no but it's not but i mean everybody it. everybody can it's just i remember a friend of mine saying she wanted to start this kind of idea of one small thing if everybody just did one small thing imagine if everybody on the planet did one small thing it would yeah. make a huge difference so it, it, day by day if we can do one small thing towards that it would yeah. make a difference yeah and it is in it's your diet you know we just need to we need to look at perhaps eating a lot less meat because the the, the meat industry uh is a an industry that's damaging the the planet uh so you know we just need to find ways to move away from the things that are doing the damage uh but also find alternatives which you'll actually then enjoy more than your previous thing and uh, you know there's some fantastic restaurants and uh, food options that are plant-based uh, we just need to start to move towards those and enjoy those i've not eaten meat for you know three years now and do you actually feel healthier as a result absolutely feel fitter healthier uh and yeah I, yeah without a doubt so it so in the end it does you good as well yeah yeah uh, so i think that that's the key. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Uh, just an absolute inspiration and um, yeah, such an interesting person to find out more about. And I'm sure the listeners and viewers will believe so too. So thanks very much for spending time uh, this morning, Steph, uh, and enjoy thank the rest of your time in Norfolk. I will do. Thank you, Lisa. And your timing is perfect. I'm sat here outside. And I've just noticed that I've got 2% left on my laptop. So your timing is impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks for that. Bye Thanks, for now. Lisa. Cheers. Bye.